Today's lecture is about a new concept, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Basically, we're going to start with a transformation with y is equal to ax, and we'll find a new problem that for some vectors x, that matrix A acts like it were a scalar. So that new problem will look like A applied to such vectors x turns out to be nothing but a constant time set vector x. So let's start. Finite dimensional vector spaces, we found that they have bases, but bases are not unique. For example, if I take i, j, k in three space, I can rotate i, j, k around and any one position I put i, j, k in would be a basis for three space. So the question that that raises is, can we find good basis to use? But what does good mean? Good means in some context. So the context we'll take is a linear transformation, y is equal to ax, but we'll take a special case, a has to be square. So this linear transformation maps rn to rn, where n is the size of that square matrix. It turns out that indeed, these linear transformations have special directions associated with them. So let's look at some examples. The first one I'll pull out is orthogonal projections. So we're given a plane that we're going to project into. It's oriented whichever way in three space. We have a vector that's orthogonal to the plane, the Z axis typically, if the plane were the XY plane. And we are going to do the orthogonal projection of any one vector into that plane. Now look at the vector along the z-axis, that vector that's orthogonal to the plane. If I project that vector onto the plane, what I'm going to get is the origin. So that vector, the projection of x1, is equal to zero. If I take a vector in the plane, and I project it into the plane, well, it's already in the plane. So the projection of a vector in the plane, x2, is going to be px2 equal to x2. x2 will not change. So we have two cases here, two directions of interest. If I start with a vector in the plane, px is equal to x. x didn't change. If I start with a vector from the origin to a point orthogonal to the plane, then when I project that vector, I get zero. And both of these equations can be represented the same way, that P acting on such a vector X is equal to a constant lambda times X. And in two examples, lambda were equal to one and lambda equal to zero. For our next example, let us look at reflection to a plane. So we'll have the same plane as before, the same norm orthogonal axis as before. But this time the operation is reflection through the plane, which means that if we take a vector x, we project it orthogonally onto that plane, and then we go out the same distance in the opposite direction. So a vector that happens to be orthogonal to the plane, px1, when I apply that reflection through it, rx1, I end up at minus x1. So rx1 should be minus x1. rx2 should be x2. And as a consequence, if I start with that vector in the plane, rx1 is 1x. If I start with a vector from the origin to a point orthogonal to the plane, rx is minus x, that is minus 1 times x. And both of these cases have the form Rx is equal to lambda x. And this time, the constant lambda is equal to, in one case, it's equal to plus 1. In the other case, it's equal to minus 1. For my next example, let's rotate about an axis. So let's apply a rotation to a vector. And the picture now looks like this. Again, I have an axis of rotation. And that axis of rotation is orthogonal to some plane. If I pick a vector along that axis of rotation and I look at what rotation around that axis does, it doesn't change that axis vector. So R applied to x1 doesn't change x1, it's simply x1. If I take a vector inside a plane that's orthogonal to x1, here it is x2, and I rotate it, 
that vector x2 is going to change direction. It's going to be rotated into a different position. And therefore, no, I don't seem to have a constant times x2 applied to it. But the point is that x2 stays in that plane, in a plane orthogonal to the axis. It will turn out that there still is a constant that multiplies it, except it has to be complex. So we'll see that complex numbers creep in a little bit for rotations. So again, what do we have? For a vector on that axis of rotation, r x is equal to 1x. And the form again is r of x is equal to a constant times x. And a constant for rotation along the axis is equal to 1. Another example is dilation. Look at this example here. y is equal to the matrix 2003 times x. And I have a challenge for you at this point. Pause the video and try and figure out what those special rotations are and what the multipliers are associated with them. This time you'll find that the multipliers are not 1, 0, and minus 1, but two other numbers. So please pause. And now that you're back, what I hope you found is that one special direction lies along the x-axis, and the multiplier associated with it is 2. And the other special direction lies along the y-axis, and the multiplier associated with it is 3. So we have constants that happen to be whatever numbers happen to creep up from our matrices. One point I should make is that Actually, we're talking not so much about special directions, but hyperplanes. Let me go back to one of those figures. If you think about the orthogonal reflection through a plane, for example, if I take that x1 vector, the x1 vector transforms to minus x1, but that applies to any one vector on the orthogonal line here. If I were to pick x1 half as long as before, that vector would reflect to minus that vector. And so any one vector on the orthogonal line, any one vector in the span of x1, in that hyperplane, which happens to be a line in this case, any one such vector has the property that the reflection applied to that vector is equal to minus times that vector. Similarly, for vectors in the plane of reflection, any one vector in that plane has the property that when I reflect it through the plane, it stays in place. So the property that Rx is equal to lambda x doesn't apply to just one vector x. It applies to vectors in a hyperplane, in this case, the orthogonal axis and the plane of reflection. So let's go back and look at this algebraically. This time around, if I take a vector x that has that property, so a matrix A times x is equal to lambda x. If I change the length of that vector, if I look at alpha x instead, and I try and figure out what happens, well, A times alpha x, the alpha comes straight out, and Ax is equal to lambda x as before. So A applied to alpha x is equal to alpha x times lambda, and therefore has the exact same property. Similarly, if I talk about two vectors that happen to have that property, x1 and x2, two vectors that have this property that ax1 is equal to lambda x1, ax2 is equal to lambda x2 for that same value lambda, for that same constant, I have the property that the, any linear combination of that, those two vectors, therefore any vector in the hyperplane defined by their span has the property that a times that vector is equal to that constant times that vector. So ax is equal to lambda x is a problem that has interesting solutions. That leads us to a definition. Namely, start with a matrix A, make sure it's square, size n, and look at solutions of ax equals lambda x. If we can find such a solution for some scalar lambda, we'll call it an eigenvector. However, 
if you look here, AX equals lambda X, X equals zero is always a solution of that equation. X equals zero, the origin, doesn't have a direction associated with it, so it's not an interesting case. So we'll restrict the eigenvector to be non-zero vectors. So X is an eigenvector if and only if it's non-zero and has the property that AX is equal to lambda X for some scalar lambda, well, that scalar lambda also has a name. We'll call it an eigenvalue of A. And as a consequence, any one eigenvector X has an associated eigenvalue lambda. And if I look at the X and the lambda, I have a pair of objects here. I've got the scalar lambda, the eigenvalue, and a vector X, the corresponding eigenvector. And I'll call these an eigenpair for that matrix A. Two comments, therefore. The trivial solution, remember, is not interesting. And the other thing is that word eigen. Eigen is actually German, and what it means is proper, characteristic. So in this theory, we'll see eigen applied to all sorts of concepts. Right now, we have an eigen value and an eigen vector and an eigen pair. The question that I want to address next is, can we find eigenvectors, and how do we decide whether or not something is an eigenvector algebraically? So far, we've only talked about the geometry, where indeed it looks like such vectors exist. So let me show you an example and pull out some eigenvectors for that example, and we'll check each time whether or not we indeed have an eigenvector. Here's my matrix. Don't be upset with the large integers here. All the problems that you're likely to see in exercises are going to be set up so that the overall result is simple. So here's a set of vectors, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. And I want to check whether or not these are eigenvectors. Well, the way to do that is to compute a times x. So that will give us a new vector. And the question is, is this new vector is a times x some lambda times x. So we have to check whether or not there exists such a constant lambda, such that ax is equal to lambda x. Let's look at the first vector. If I compute a times x1, I get minus 11, 6, and 1. Well, is this a constant times this vector? If I look for the 6, for example, 6 times this vector would give me that entry 6 in that second position, but 6 times minus 3 is not equal to minus 11. So no, this vector is equal to some constant times that vector, does not have a solution. So this x1 is not an eigenvector of the matrix A. Let's look at the next example. The next vector x2, when I compute ax2, I get minus 3, 0, minus 1. So 3, 0, 1 goes to minus 3, 0, minus 1. It goes to minus x2. So yes, uh, x2 is an eigenvector of that matrix A, and the multiplier applied to x2 tilde is equal to minus 1 times x2. So lambda equals minus 1 is an eigenvalue for that matrix. The next example is minus 4, 3, 1. And what we get is minus 8, 6, 2. And when we check, we see that that is indeed 2 times x3. So that vector x3 is also an eigenvector of A, and its eigenvalue is equal to 2. So I have an eigenpair, 2, uh, and the vector minus 4, 3, 1. x4. Well, x4 is the zero vector. Wait a second. We say that eigenvectors have to be non-zero. So we immediately say, no, x4 is not an eigenvector by definition. And finally, x5. If I look at x5 and I multiply this vector x5 from the left by a, I find the zero vector, zero, zero, zero. But the zero vector on the right-hand side, that's just zero times this vector. So yes, this is an eigenvector and it has eigenvalue lambda equals zero. So what we ended up with, therefore, is we have an interesting new problem. Ax is equal to lambda x. We want to find solutions of Ax equals lambda x, where lambda is a constant we don't know, and 
x are vectors such that x equals lambda x. So let's try and solve this. To solve it, we're going to take our problem and make it into something more uh, familiar. So let's look at this problem again. We're going to transform it. So ax is equal to lambda x. If I pull all the x's to one side, I have ax minus lambda x equals zero, and it looks like I might be able to factor out the x, but that would lead to a, a matrix, minus a lambda, minus the constant. So the trick is to rewrite x as i times x. And now I can factor, because now what I have is a, a matrix, minus lambda times i is a matrix of the same size, so that difference exists, times x is equal to zero. In this form, what I see is I have a homogeneous problem, a homogeneous solution problem. Namely, if I knew lambda, I could call this matrix here a sub lambda, and I'd have that matrix times x equals zero, so I'm looking for homogeneous solutions. The key to solving this problem is to remember that what we want is non-zero solutions of x. In other words, my homogeneous problem here must have three variables. Otherwise, I would only find the solution x equals zero. My matrix is square. And therefore, free variables means that the matrix is not invertible. So this matrix doesn't have an inverse. And we saw before that, that what that means is, among others, that the determinant of this matrix must be equal to zero. So in order to have free variables, I have to look at the determinant of that matrix A minus lambda I equal to zero as one possible way of trying to get lambdas. Let me give you an example. Look at the matrix A, 1, 2, 2, 1. If I subtract lambda i from it, well, that subtracts lambdas from the diagonal, since that's the only place where i has non-zero entries. So A minus lambda i looks like 1 minus lambda, 2, 2, and 1 minus lambda. So minus lambda of the diagonal. If I compute the determinant of that matrix, I get the determinant of our matrix here. If I compute it, it multiplies out to the polynomial, to lambda squared minus two lambda minus three. Uh, so I have a polynomial of degree two that came out of this equation. And what I have to require, therefore, in order to have non-zero solutions x to my homogeneous problem, I have to require that polynomial to add up to zero. What that means is I have to find the roots of that polynomial. The special cases lambda equals 3 and lambda equals minus 1 actually solve that polynomial equal to 0. So if I pull out lambda equals 3, I will have non-zero solutions, eigenvectors associated with an eigenvalue 3, and lambda equals minus 1, I'll also have homogeneous solutions. It turns out that the general case is extremely similar. The easy way to see that is to remember another form of the determinant that we saw when we first investigated determinants, namely that I can write the determinant as a product of entries in that matrix with a sign multiplying it, and that sign can be either plus one or minus one, or zero if I throw too many terms at it. But the way I get the non-zero terms, the plus one and minus one, is if I start with my matrix over here, that I have to produce terms so that I pull out one entry from every row and one entry from every column. So over here, I pulled out entry A12. So in the first row, I chose this entry and therefore I can't choose from the column anymore. For the next row, I chose this term and now both of these columns are out. Here I chose this term. Now the first two columns and this column are out. And so it's one entry in every row, one entry in every column. That makes up the non-zero entries in this expression. And I have to sum up all possible choices of those entries in that matrix. So what that says, if I think about that, is that when I compute the determinant of, well, the diagonal terms are going to have a minus lambda of it. But when I compute the determinant, all I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be multiplying 
entries in that matrix together, and some of them have lambda terms in them, some of them don't, but the product that I get will be a polynomial. And in terms of how many lambdas, what's the degree of the polynomial? Well, the lambdas sit on the diagonal. The maximum number of lambdas I can get is by picking this term, this term, this term, all the terms on the diagonal. So and multiplying out a11 minus lambda, a22 minus lambda, all the way to a n n minus lambda. And when I multiply that out, well, if I pick lambda in this term, lambda in this term, lambda in that term, in those entries, I get lambda to the n as the degree of my polynomial. And since there are n minus signs associated with it, there's going to be a plus or minus sign depending on whether n is even or odd. So the determinant of a minus lambda i always works out to be a polynomial of degree n, where n is the size of my matrix. That means that the solutions, the possible lambdas that I can find for which I have non-zero solutions x for this interesting problem are the roots of a polynomial. So we'll give this polynomial a name. And for once, it's not the eigen polynomial. This is the one exception where we replace eigen with characteristic in English. So it is the characteristic polynomial of its matrix A. So all it is, is the determinant of A minus lambda I. And what we want is we want to find the solutions, uh, the roots of this determinant, this polynomial set equal to zero. So once we have such roots, once we have found lambdas for which that equation therefore has solutions, we're left with solving for the x's. Well, the x's will be the homogeneous solutions for a lambda x for those lambdas that I just found. So the second step, finding solutions, finding eigenvectors, once I have eigenvalues, will be to find the homogeneous solution of this matrix that I know once I know lambda. So what we have to do is we have to talk a little bit about properties of polynomials. Let's refresh our memories from what we know from algebra. And we are going to limit our A matrices to have real numbers, and therefore our polynomials will have real coefficients. So we look at polynomials of degree n with real coefficients. The very first fact we want to know about those polynomials is that they have n roots. Whatever the degree is, they have that many roots, and only that many roots, n roots. However, the roots do not necessarily have to be distinct. So, for example, lambda minus 1 quantity squared only has the root plus 1. It just happens to occur twice. Suppose we have the roots lambda 1 through lambda n for a polynomial. The next big result in algebra is that that means that that polynomial can be factored, and it can be factored in the following form. Lambda minus the first root times lambda minus the second root, all the way to lambda minus the nth root, and some coefficient that happens to be the coefficient of the lambda to the n term, the highest degree term in the polynomial. If you look, if you plug in lambda equals lambda 1, that product collapses to 0, lambda equals lambda 2, it collapses to 0. So each one of the roots is indeed a 0 of the polynomial written in this form. In our case, that constant sitting out front happens to be minus 1 to the n. So here's an example. If I take p of lambda equal to this cubic, you can verify that the form lambda plus 1 times lambda minus 3 times lambda minus 3 with a minus sign out front indeed multiplies out to that cubic. And so you see that lambda equals minus 1 is a root, makes this term 0. Lambda equals plus 3 is a root, it makes that term 0. And that lambda equals 3 actually occurs twice. So my roots are not unique. Here they are minus 1, 3, and 3. The next property that you want to know is you have encountered before that polynomials have complex roots at times, depending on the coefficients. So what happens if there is a complex root, even though all the coefficients of my polynomial were real? Well, the theorem associated with that is if I take a complex root, a real part plus i times an imaginary part, if that is a root, 
then the complex conjugate replacing i by minus i, the complex conjugate must also be a root. And if one of these roots occurs k times, then the complex conjugate must also occur k times. So here's an example, and again, I started down here, of course, and multiplied it out. Here's my polynomial, and that polynomial can be rewritten in terms of the roots. And so here you have lambda minus the complex number 3 plus i occurs twice. So I have a square on that term. And therefore, since 3 plus i is a root, 3 minus i must be a root. It must also occur twice. And lambda equals 0 happened to be a root in this case. So complex conjugate pairs with occurring the same number of times. Now, I already hinted that what I did is I took my solution and I multiplied it out to get the original polynomial. And the reason I did that is because factoring is actually a very hard problem. Polynomials with degree 4, there's no algebraic formula anymore. And for degrees 3 and 4, the formulae are quite complicated. And if you try to plug numbers in, they turn out to be very difficult numerically. It's very easy to get, quote, solutions that are very far from what the actual solution should be. So root-finding algorithms, trying to factor a polynomial, they have to result in approximate solutions, and there are all sorts of iterative refinement methods to find roots. So the examples in the exercises you will have are all going to be chosen so that finding roots is easy. The next comment here is that remember that roots are not necessarily distinct. And whenever they are not distinct, we are going to combine them. We are going to write lambda minus a root to whatever power, and the power is how often those occur. And what that means is if you have a polynomial of degree n that has k roots, where k is not necessarily n when the roots are not distinct, then if I rewrite it with the idea of writing those powers, I get c times lambda minus the first root to however often that root occurs, lambda minus a second different root with an exponent of how often that root occurs, all the way to lambda minus lambda k to the mk to how often the kth root occurs. Of course, any one of these powers could be equal to 1. We'll give names to these powers. We will call them the algebraic multiplicities of the roots lambda. So how often that root occurs in my expression. And what you might realize is that the algebraic multiplicities must add up to the degree of polynomials. For example, over here, multiplicity 2, multiplicity 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, multiplicity 1 is 5, that adds up to the degree of the polynomial that adds up to life. Now that we know about polynomials, we are going to exploit that structure. So the very first thing we do is exploit that root decomposition for a characteristic polynomial. First consequence, we take our characteristic polynomial. It has the form minus 1 to the n times a polynomial lambda to the n plus the next term has some multiply applied to it. Let's look at that multiplier. If I look at where that multiplier is coming from in the determinant of a minus lambda i, well, I have to have n minus 1 lambdas. But if I pick n minus 1 lambda term, the only term left over is the last lambda term as well. So the lambda n minus 1 term also comes from the product of the diagonals of that matrix. And if I multiply that out, what I see is minus 1 to the n times a lambda to the n term. And then for the lambda to the n minus 1 term, I'm going to have to pick, say, if I pick a11 in this term, then I have to pick the lambdas for all the other terms. If I pick a22 as the term where I don't have the lambda, then I have to pick the, all of the lambdas from the other terms. So what I'm going to see is, first of all, one less minus sign. And the other one is that all the a's come in as a sum. So I'm going to get minus 1 times 
the sum of the diagonal terms in my matrix times lambda to the n minus 1. Now I can also compute this term by looking at the root decomposition of the polynomial. So if I look at my decomposition into the roots, so lambda 1 through lambda n, and multiply this out, then I find that this time around, that constant term, that tau term, is minus the sum of the eigenvalues. Compare. Here it's minus the sum of the diagonal terms of the matrix, and then the other form is minus the sum of the eigenvalues. Therefore, we have the following important concept. The sum of the diagonal terms of a matrix, so just sum down that main diagonal, we will give it a name, we'll call it the trace of A. And the reason the trace of A is important is because if I look at the lambdas, and I emphasize that the lambdas are not necessarily distinct, right? So if any one lambda occurs more than once, you have to count each one of them. If you sum up the lambdas, that sum adds up to the trace of the matrix. We can also look at the constant term in the polynomial. Well, the constant term of the polynomial, we, are, we define the polynomial as the determinant of a minus lambda i. If I set lambda equals zero, I'm evaluating the polynomial that lambda is equal to zero. So the constant term in my polynomial is equal to the determinant of a. But if I look at the root decomposition, plugging in zero into the root decomposition of the polynomial, I see that what I get is the product of the eigenvalues. So the determinant of A is equal to the product of the eigenvalues. Let's call that a theorem. Our invertible matrix theorem now has a new line in it. The A inverse exists if and only if the determinant is non-zero, but that says if and only if all of the lambdas are not zero. Because if any one lambda, if any one eigenvalue is equal to zero, that product is zero and the determinant of A is zero. If none of them are zero, this number is not zero. That product is not zero and the determinant of A is not zero. You can ask whether or not other powers of lambda are related to the entries in the matrix A, and the answer, of course, is yes. So all you have to do is compare the two expansions. But the two most important ones are the trace and the determinant. The second entry, lambda to the n minus 1, and lambda to the 0, the last entry. We are now ready to start some eigenvector and eigenvalue computation examples. For the first one, let's look at a very simple two by two example. So here's my matrix. It has entries 0, 2, minus 1, and 3. And what we want to do is compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So in the first step, we start with computing the eigenvalues, that is the roots of the characteristic polynomial. So we set up P of lambda, and P of lambda is the determinant of A minus lambda i. So we have to subtract lambda from the diagonal. So the determinant of minus lambda, 2, minus 1, 3, minus lambda. And then we multiply that out, we get lambda squared minus 3 lambda plus 2. At this point, we have to find the eigenvalues. So we have to find the roots of this polynomial. Well, it's just a quadratic equation. So we know how to write down the roots. And what we find is that the roots are 1 and 2. So the polynomial, therefore, factors as lambda minus 1 times lambda minus 2. There's no minus sign out front because it's minus one to the power two that's even, so a plus sign. That means that there are exactly two lambda values for which we can have non-zero solutions, for which we will have non-zero solutions for ax equals lambda x. But before we start with those, let's quickly do the trace test. The trace of the matrix is the sum of the diagonal entries, so zero, plus 3, 0 plus 3 is 3. The eigenvalues sum to 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, and therefore the trace is indeed equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. So we are relatively confident that we didn't make a mistake that we indeed have the correct eigenvalues. We now proceed with the second step, which is to compute basis for the associated eigenspaces. So we have two cases to consider. 
the case lambda is equal to 1, the first eigenvalue, and lambda is equal to 2, the second eigenvalue. Let's start with lambda equals 1. We set up the matrix A minus lambda i, plugging in lambda that equals 1, that's just A minus i, and we get the matrix minus 1, 2, minus 1, 2, and what we want is the null space, so we do Gaussian elimination, and we find this matrix here that has indeed a missing pivot. Now we know we have to have a missing pivot, that's how we chose the lambdas to begin with. So if you don't have a missing pivot, let me emphasize, no missing pivot means a mistake, means you have to fix the mistake. We have a missing pivot, so we can find the null space. The null space has basis vector 2, 1 in this case. So any number times this vector is going to be an eigenvector, except for 0, 0, of course. The remark again, so let me emphasize one more time, you must have a missing pivot. It's a mistake I see quite frequently that people don't get a missing pivot and happily proceed with their computations as if nothing were wrong, and then everything falls apart. Case lambda equals 2. For lambda equals 2, we now have to look at a minus 2i. And again, setting up the matrix and running Gaussian elimination, this is the reduced row echelon form that we wrote. Actually, it is a row echelon form. It's not reduced because that didn't scale out to minus 1. Finding the null space, well, there's an obvious null space vector 1, 1 that comes out of this. So at this point, we have both the eigenvalues and the associated basis vectors. Let's collect the whole thing in a summary table. So there's actually two things I'll do. One is I'll have the table, and two, I'll have a graph for that table. The table starts with, in the first row, I have the eigenvalues, lambda. We found two eigenvalues, lambda equals 1 and lambda equals 2. They had multiplicities. For lambda equals 1, the multiplicity was 1. For lambda equals 2, that algebraic multiplicity was 1 as well. And when we computed the null space, we found basis vectors for lambda equals 1, the basis vector was 2, 1. For lambda equals 2, the basis vector is 1, 1. To the left, there's a graph of this case. You have two vectors here, x1 and x2. The eigenvector basis for lambda 1 in green and for lambda equals 2 in the red. What we have computed is that any one vector along the line of the green vector that has eigenvalue 1, any one vector, if we apply a to it, a times x1, is going to give us that same vector. So on this line here, on the line from the green arrow, the property is ax is equal to x. For the red arrow, that is the eigenvalue 2 basis vector. So any one vector on this line, if we apply a to it, we are going to find 2a as the result. For example, if I apply a to the vector x2 here, that goes through 1, 1, 2 times that vector, a applied to that vector is going to go to 2, 2. Well, let's try a slightly bigger example, a 3 by 3 example. Here's my matrix, and again, the numbers seem a little bit forbidding, but they really aren't. The example is set up so as to give easy computations. The first step, as always, is to compute the eigenvalues. That is, we have to find the characteristic polynomial and find the roots of that polynomial. So. The computation, therefore, the determinant of a minus lambda i, we subtract lambda of the diagonal, here it is, and then we have to multiply this out carefully. And one thing I want to show you here is be on the lookout for common factors. So that first determinant, the 3 by 3 determinant, I notice that that second column just has a single entry in it. So I will have a factor of 2 minus lambda times the determinant that's left. That factor 2 minus lambda, pull out the minus sign to see it in standard form, it's minus lambda minus 2. So we know that lambda minus 2 is a factor, we know that 2 is an eigenvalue. Now uh, the rest of the determinant is in the bracket here, but everything is multiplied out. We find that the eigenvalue 2 occurs twice, and the third eigenvalue is lambda is equal to 0, and therefore the whole polynomial factors in this form, lambda minus 2 squared and lambda minus 0 to the first power. 
Now that we have the eigenvalues, we're going to compute the eigenspaces. So again, we have two cases, the case lambda equals two and the case lambda equals zero. Let's start with lambda equals two. The computation proceeds by subtracting two i of the matrix A, which leaves us this matrix here. So now I see a missing pivot right away. And indeed, when I do Gaussian elimination, I actually see that I have two missing pivots. And therefore, my null space has two free variables associated with it, so two basis vectors. And the ones I computed are right here. This is a basis for a null space. Now for the case lambda equals zero. For the case lambda equals zero, we have to compute a minus zero i, in other words, a itself. And when we do Gaussian elimination, we find a single missing pivot. And solving for the null space, we get a null space vector a minus three one, a single vector. If we summarize everything now, and we always should, so we are going to build that summary table as our third step. Here it is, again, we have the lambdas, the eigenvalues appearing in the first row. We had an eigenvalue two and an eigenvalue zero. The algebraic multiplicities associated with them are in the second row. So lambda equals two had algebraic multiplicity two, it occurred twice, and lambda equals zero had algebraic multiplicity once, it occurred exactly one. The associated eigenvector basis for lambda equals two, I found two vectors, so here they are, and for lambda equals zero, we found a single eigenvector basis, dimension one, here it is. So the dimension of the eigenspace associated with lambda equals two is two, it's a plane, and the dimension of the eigenspace associated with lambda equals one is one, it is a line. On the left here, I've shown uh, the actual planes that we get, so in blue, are the two eigenvectors for lambda equals two. They define a plane, that plane in this reddish color here. For lambda equals zero, there's a single basis vector. So lambda equals zero, here's this basis vector, lambda equals zero defines this line along the green arrow. And what we now see is that if we take a vector that lies in this red plane, any one vector in this red plane, if we apply A to it, we are going to get two times that vector. So if I pull the vector x1, 2 here, the result is going to be two times this vector. If I pull this vector, it's two times that vector. Any other vector in this plane will come out as two times that vector. For the vectors along the green line, they have eigenvalue zero. So any vector along this green line defined by that basis vector minus one, three, one, if we apply A to it, it will collapse it to the origin. So any vector along this line, A times that vector is going to be zero, 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 since the eigenvalue is zero. Since the eigenvalue is zero, this particular matrix has determinant zero. It is not invertible. So what's our takeaway for today? Well, we found an interesting problem to look at, the AX equals constant times x problem, lambda x. And we were able to solve it by rewriting it and finding that we wanted non-zero solution. That meant that determinant of a minus lambda i had to be zero. That's a polynomial. And when you compute that, I want you to remember to try and do the trace test. Some of the eigenvalues equal to the trace. It will catch a lot of errors. Once we have the eigenvalues, we're going to proceed to step two, where we find the eigenspaces. But well, the eigenspaces are just the null space of a minus lambda i for each of my eigenvalues lambda i. And again, what I want you to remember is that as you try and compute those null spaces, there must be missing pivots. You can't find just the solution x equals zero and say that's an eigenvector. It is not. If there's not a missing pivot, you need to fix your arithmetic. And finally, we are going to summarize our results in a table. And the reason for that is we are going to build on the table. It's going to capture everything so it's easy to see, easy to understand.